Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Appa Similani, uh, director of Iranian Studies Program here. Welcome to uh, our event tonight. Uh, let me say uh, one word about it. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, our guest uh, tonight, uh, uh, Professor Naribi, Nima Naribi. She is the chair of the English department uh, at uh, Ryerson University, if I spell uh, uh, it's uh, one of the major universities. Uh, it says in the, it's the most thriving university. I was reading their website in the heart of Toronto. And the English department is a fairly substantial English department. She is the chair of the uh, program. She was educated in Canada. And her area of expertise has been uh, the question of women, uh, women's literature, uh, colonial discourse, uh, diasporatic uh, discourse. Uh, this is essentially the second book that she has uh, published, both of them with the uh, University of Minnesota Press, that is truly in the field of cultural studies, one of the preeminent uh, university presses for this specific area, cultural studies, women's studies, critical uh, theory. Uh, and the subject of her talk today is uh, the, uh, representation of women's lives in uh, Iranian women's lives in diaspora, whether it is in a uh, memoir, whether it's an autobiography, whether it is in documentaries, or whether it is in Facebook and social media. Uh, in spite of all the efforts by the Iranian regime to force women to play the traditional family role, Iranian women have been at the forefront both inside Iran and outside Iran, creatively, uh, uh, scientifically, uh, entrepreneurially, and she is focusing on their rather remarkable output in uh, uh, the U.S. particularly, in English languages uh, particularly. Uh, I, I've had the pleasure of uh, uh, reading it. Uh, I strongly uh, urge you to read it. Uh, it is uh, uh, a very uh, detailed, erudite, uh, precise uh, examination of some of the more remarkable works that have become very popular in Western uh, uh, in the U.S., from uh, Azar and Afisi's uh, work, Reading Lolita, to other memoirs, to Satrapi's work, about which she has uh, written. She has agreed to kindly sign books at the end, so there are books uh, available, and uh, I strongly urge you to avail yourself of this wonderful opportunity. And I have to uh, uh, end by thanking my dear friend uh, Mehdi Safipur, who first kindly sent me a copy of the book to read, and I read it, and uh, I said we have to have uh, uh, this remarkable scholar here. So please, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Milani, for that very, very generous uh, uh -huh. introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such an honor for me to be here, uh, and I would like to express my uh, deep uh, appreciation to the Stanford Iranian Studies Program and to Dr. Abbas Milani, a renowned scholar uh, and the author of a wonderful memoir himself, actually, uh, for this generous invitation. I'm grateful also to Roma Parhat. I just realized I should stand next to the recording. Right? Um, I'm grateful also to Roma Parhad and Franco Erico um, for facil facilitating my visit here and for being so helpful with all of the administrative details. Um, now, I have to confess that uh, I've been in denial about the fact that I need reading glasses, and I think this is now the time when I have to accept the fact that I need to wear them. So, <laughs> excuse me a moment. So uh, it is a real privilege uh, to have this opportunity to speak with you about my book, Women Write Iran, Nostalgia and Human Rights from the Diaspora. What I plan to do this evening is to offer a general overview of my argument in the book and to give you a sense of how I work with these various theories of autobiography, life writing, nostalgia, and human rights. So I'm going to spend the first half of this talk speaking about life writing and nostalgia, and then in the second half of the talk, I'll shift my focus to uh, testimonial writing and prison narratives. In structuring my talk in this way, I'm hoping you'll get a sense of the book as a whole. As Farzane Miloni has uh, famously pointed out uh, in her now canonical book, uh, in Iranian studies, Veils and Words. 
Traditionally, the genre of autobiography um, was not popular in an Iranian cultural context, particularly for women, uh, because this genre of public self-disclosure um, was seen as a form of uh, a, a form of sort of metaphorical unveiling um, that challenged the gendered notion of sham, which she uh, defined as a combination of charm and shame, which is very specific to this sort of ideal, modest Iranian woman. As uh, Milani has uh, herself noted, since the late 1990s, however, a growing number of Iranian women outside of Iran are turning to the genre of autobiography to narrate their personal experiences of life in post-revolutionary Iran and in the diaspora. This trend towards life writing and public disclosures needs to be understood, it seems to me, as part of the literary uh, phenomenon that autobiography critics have called uh, the memoir boom or the age of memoir. Notable for me was how these diasporic Iranian memoirs were received by scholars who work on Iranian literature and culture. And I have to tell you, it was not at all positive. Right? Um, some critiqued what they identified as an imperialist um, thrust to these memoirs. Others went further and made direct connections between neoconservative institutions in the United States and specific uh, memoirists. Uh, in large part, though, I think that the uh, critiques against diasporic Iranian memoirs seems to come from a historical suspicion of the genre of uh, memoir itself. I was wondering if it's upside down, but it's not. <laughs> okay. um, so Thomas Kauser, who's a theorist of memoir, um, has written about this prejudice. Um, and he said, until quite recently, memoir was minor and autobiography major. Memoir subliterary and autobiography literary. Memoir shallow and autobiography deep. Memoir marginal and autobiography canonical. So part of the prejudice against the genre of the memoir versus the autobiography seems to be a sense that autobiography offers a long retrospective lens uh, on a life usually of a known personality, usually male. Right? Um, and it connotes a thoughtfulness uh, and an ability to think critically that the memoir, with its focus on a shorter period of time or a singular event in a person's life, does not. The memoir tends to be understood as more emotional and therefore less reliable in its recording of events than an autobiography which is seen as more rational, balanced portrayal of a person's life. So for me, Iranian memoirs are particularly interesting in their mediation of the diasporic experience through the author's memories of pre-revolutionary Iran, thus placing the concepts of memory and nostalgia and questions of testimony and witness at the heart of these narratives. These memoirs are deeply emotional. They are deeply affecting in the stories that they tell. While some critics have been inclined to discredit them for being too emotional, my interest lies precisely in their emotional and affective qualities. I'm curious about the kinds of responses uh, these memoirs generate or invite. What do expressions of nostalgia, empathy, and compassion do? How do they circulate, and what do they demand of us as readers? In my time today, I will focus first on the specter of revolution in these memoirs, as it really is at the heart of so many of these nostalgic narratives. And then I'll move on to talk about testimony. Now, I should also say that while the 1980s saw a smattering of autobiographical writings by, um, uh, by former members of the um, monarchy or the aristocracy, um, many of these stories were focused on uh, the specificity of the individual's narrative. Um, they traced the end of a particular era of you know, privilege and power and so on, and told the story of the author's perseverance in the diaspora. But there's been a shift, right? So, and I think that really started in, late, in the late 1990s. So Tara Bahrampur's uh, To See and See Again, um, A Life in Iran and America, and Gelara Osoyesh's Saffron Sky, A Life Between Iran and America, were the first texts by a generation of authors whose childhood was interrupted by the violence of revolution. This is the generation of Iranian youth, sometimes referred to as the burnt generation. Too young to have participated in the events of the revolution, they were nevertheless deeply affected by it. Like Majon Satafi's uh, child avatar in her graphic narrative, Persepolis, <coughs> Persepolis 1 and 2, 
Um, this generation served as witnesses to the unfolding of history, but without the ability to engage in any meaningful way with the events that transpired. In other words, history happened to this generation and without their input. This was the generation that existed on the margins of revolution, deeply affected by it, but unable to have a voice. So these texts serve to illustrate the connections I'm making between autobiographical disclosures and nostalgia, and the ways in which these converge in the diasporic Iranian context. I'm interested in the pull of nostalgia and the desire for return in autobiographical narratives, even as this desire for return home has at times placed the author in a somewhat uh, uh, perilous position, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. To see and see again, <clears throat> and Saffron Sky, chronicles the narrator's hyphenated lives as they move between Iran and America in the aftermath of the 1979 revolution. These autobiographies, published in 1999, are the first among a now substantial corpus of texts by a generation of diasporic Iranian women, many of whom experienced the 79 revolution in uh, pre or early adolescence and then immigrated to the West with their families. So this particular wave of Iranian memoirs um, what is produced by authors whose childhood was uh, interrupted. Um, thus, the predominant sentiment in these texts, nostalgia for a lost and idealized childhood, is deeply bound up with nostalgia for a lost pre-revolutionary nation. These authors pen nostalgic reflections of their past, inflected with a keen longing for home. For diasporic writers, unlike for travel writers, it's the return that's the fantasy, not the departure. For them, there is little romance in being elsewhere. These life narratives emphasize the importance of memory and of a careful remembering, and I'm using this in the dual sense um, of uh, recall and piecing together, right? of personal stories of families and friends that have remained half told, lost in that frenzied shuffle between nations, between an Iran of their past and a North America or Europe of their future. Stressing the feelings of loss that mark the condition of the exilic diasporic subject, Bahrampur's memoir encapsulates the anxieties of cultural, emotional, and geographical displacement reflected in the life narratives produced by Iranian women in the diaspora. Here is a quote um, <clears throat> that I really like, that had a really profound effect on me, um, and that illustrates quite succinctly the diasporic anxiety about which I've been speaking. So Bahrampur says, in Iran, your place becomes empty when you leave and stays empty as long as you are away. But what if the one who leaves forgets about his empty place? What if by living so long in America or England or France, he starts to, be, be, he starts to become part of those countries and no longer remembers his original home? The Iranian expression, your place is empty, implies that the memory of a person remains alive in the hearts of those left behind and that the exilic subject can always find and reclaim her place again upon her return home. But the anxieties that are part of the diasporic condition lead Bahrampur to wonder what might happen if she forgets the sounds, the smells, the rhythm of life in her home country, and through this forgetting, lose a piece of her identity, herself. What happens to a person who by force of historical events leaves her home never again to return? How does she preserve the memory of her personal and cultural history while managing to navigate a present reality, uh, a new life in a foreign land? These are the questions that haunt the diasporic subject and that emerge in various ways in autobiographical texts by diasporic Iranians. Scholars who work on nostalgia and memory have noted that historically, nostalgia was a condition uh, diagnosed as a debilitating medical disease. Nostalgia has thus tended historically to be regarded in negative terms. Initially viewed as a curable medical ailment, it was later considered to be uh, a form of psychological trauma. Once it was no longer dis uh, diagnosed as a medical and therefore treatable condition, nostalgia was recast in cultural and literary contexts as an emotional wound. In popular discourse, nostalgia is often seen as a sentimental indulgence, right, which market-savvy entrepreneurs have easily attached to consumer goods. 
These negative connotations have contributed to a view of nostalgia as implying movement backward. But as Svetlana Boim has argued, nostalgia is as much about projecting a future past as it is about claiming an irretrievable past. In other words, nostalgic remembrances of pre-revolutionary Iran do not simply amount to mourning a lost Iran or a past life. They are also an expression of mourning for one's future self that might have been. In the nostalgic desire to reclaim an irretrievable place, Iran, and irretrievable time, pre-1979, lies an articulated grief for a future that could have been. At the level of the individual nostalgic, what this means is that the desire for another place and another time involves a mourning for that imagined future self, who the diasporic subject imagines herself to have become had the traumatic event, in this case the revolution, not taken place. Azadeh Mouaveni's relationship to Iran, as she describes it first in Lipstick Jihad and then in Honeymoon in Tehran, is, as in the case of other memoirists, a nostalgic one. Keenly aware um, that her desire for Iran is shaped and mediated through what she repeatedly refers to as the dusty memories of her diasporic family and friends, Mouaveni's nostalgia for Iran can be understood through Marianne Hirsch's concept of post-memory, a memory passed down through generations. While Mouaveni's lipstick jihad, much like Bahram Pour's to see and see again, is interwoven with nostalgic memories of Iran, Mouaveni's text is particularly interesting since her longing for home precedes her visit to the country. And she sees Iran for the first time at age five. Her visit re-cements her nostalgia for an Iran mediated through the, parents, through the memories of her parents' generation and their yearning for an elusive homeland. Moaveni thus inherits a powerful longing for an idealized pre-revolutionary Iran through the force of her parents' nostalgia. This feeling of longing for a home that many have never themselves seen has been usefully explained by Jennifer Delisle. Did I? Oh, sorry, these were the covers of Mouaveni's text. Um, and this is the quote from Jennifer Delap. She uh, explains it uh, as genealogical nostalgia, which she defines as follows. The affective drive to uncover, preserve, and record our family history and homeland, this notion of feeling a place in our bones despite never having seen it. The painful longing to return home defines and shapes the diasporic existence whether the object of desire is an actual physical location where a, parent, a person once resided, or whether it is simply a place known and felt only through the imagination, since the nostalgia they feel is an inherited one from previous generations. Particularly eloquent on the subject of nostalgia, Moaveni describes with poignancy the emotional effects of living at a remove from one's country of origin. Recognizing that she herself carries this burden of inherited nostalgia, Moaveni decides to return to the home of her imagination and to confront her feelings in the very place that serves as the object of her nostalgia. Upon her arrival in Iran, Moaveni relishes the warm welcome she receives from her family and describes with powerful emotion the experience of sitting in her grandfather's kitchen. <coughs> The kitchen smelt like summer, and I sat on a bar stool at the island in the center, enchanted with the abundance and the knowledge that generations of my ancestors had eaten this precise sort of apple, exactly those peaches. In this moving description of her reconnection with a personal as well as a national cultural history that until now had only existed at, as part of a carefully preserved family lore, Moavini invokes and reclaims her ancestral connections to Iran. Despite her sensitive descriptions of how nostalgia shapes the life and emotions of the diasporic subject, Moaveni is at times quite hard on diasporic Iranians and their nostalgic relationship to an Iran to which they will not or cannot return. However perceptive her description of the stresses and tensions of diasporic life, what also emerges in her memoir is her at times reproachful view of diasporic Iranians whom she characterizes as guarding stale memories of a pre-revolutionary Iran and indulging their nostalgia for an Iran that exists only in their imagination. For Moaveni then, nostalgia is for the most part quite negative. 
It encourages an ossified relationship with the country of origin and hinders a complex and comprehensive understanding and engagement with the country's contemporary politics, society, and culture. Indeed, much of Lipstick Jihad is preoccupied with the subject of nostalgia, with which Moveni connects to the topic of loyalty, loyalty to one's origins and to one's place of birth. Turning a critical lens on herself, her aunt, and her cousin, who all went to Iran under the spell of nostalgia for an Iran about which they all fantasized, she writes, all of us, Khaleh Zahra, Kimya, and I, had arrived in Tehran as Iranians of the imagination. We had Iranian identities, but they were formed by our memories and the Farsi-speaking parts of our soul. But we could not navigate the Tehran of today or share in the collective consciousness of the Iranians who never left. <coughs> Bound up with the politics of Iranian diaspora and nostalgia is thus the question of loyalty. Those who left Iran during or shortly after the revolution are seen as having abandoned the nation in the face of adversity. Those who stayed behind suffered through the immediate and bloody aftermath of the post-revolutionary period and the eight-year Iran-Iraq war. So much has happened to the country and to its inhabitants post-1979 that those who left the country and who live abroad are depicted as incapable of understanding the realities of uh, contemporary Iran. So one of the unsettling effects of this position, then, is the question of authenticity. Those who stayed behind and suffered through the war and the policies of the Islamic Republic are the real Iranians. Those who went abroad are the so-called Iranians of the imagination. For Moaveni, this question of authenticity and belonging um, and uh, of authentic and inauthentic Iranianness is the personal conflict with which she struggles continuously in terms of her own relationship to Iran and is one that surfaces repeatedly in both of her memoirs. In her second memoir, Moaveni recounts her decision to live, work, marry, and have a child in Iran. Unlike her first memoir, Honeymoon in Tehran recalibrates Moaveni's identity as perhaps more legitimately Iranian. Her successful attempt to return offers her the possibility of accessing an authentic Iranianness no longer available to the nostalgic Iranians living um, abroad. Her return, however, is short-lived. Eventually, she's forced to leave Iran, this time with her husband and small child, as it becomes increasingly obvious that she can no longer work safely uh, as a journalist in Iran. Their decision to leave is intensely conflicted and uh, prompts Malvani to raise once again the implied connection between a diasporic life and disloyalty to one's country of birth. Indeed, Arash and I were joining the great stream of educated Iranians who each year abandoned, yes, abandoned their country for better jobs and better futures abroad. <clears throat> Malvani's uh, feelings of guilt over her decision to leave Iran are shared by many diasporics and are reflected in the wave of memoirs over the past two decades. At the heart of many of these texts lies the author's struggle with her um, distance from Iran, her desire to be relevant to the country's ongoing political concerns, and an anxiety that this distance disqualifies her in having a stake in the future direction of the nation. Perhaps it is this powerful, affective combination of nostalgia and guilt that explains why, over the past two decades, a notable number of diasporic Iranian journalists, like Moaveni, decided to relocate to Iran. Following the siren song of the promise of home and belonging, numerous diasporic journalists have returned to their country of origin, but then found themselves forced to flee in the face of threats to their personal safety, as in the case of Moaveni herself. <coughs> Or in the case of Human Majd, whose memoir, um, The Ministry of Guidance, invites you to not stay. I really like that title. <laughs> um, chronicles ex his experience of moving to Iran for a year with his American wife and infant son. While he is drawn there by the magnetic pull of nostalgia, he is obliged to return to America for his own and his family's safety. In more dire cases, journalist authors such as Roxana Sabeli, Maziar Bahori, and Jason Rezoyan have gone to Iran motivated by nostalgic reimaginings of their relationship to their native country, and perhaps to exchange their post-memory of Iran for their own lived experiences. All three found themselves imprisoned as a result. This compulsion by diasporic writers to rediscover a personal history and forge connections with the lost homeland dovetails with the desire to not only reclaim 
their past connection, but also to create a legitimate space from within which they could engage with the quotidian affairs of their native land. Nostalgia, then, is complicated. At once myopic in its focus on personal experiences and memories, it is also driven by an intense longing to reconnect, to legitimize one's continuing relevance to the political and social concerns of one's country of origin. Nostalgia can also be a productive emotion. Nostalgic memories can transform the act of turning back to the past into opportunities for future engagement. The creative process of remembering, again in that dual sense um, of recall and piecing together, allows the diasporic writer to indulge in her nostalgic memories of the past, but it also forces her to come to terms with Iran in the historical present. I'm just going to take a sip of water. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So having raised the specter of prison narratives a moment ago, this is perhaps a good moment to shift my discussion um, to the second half of my talk, which is on prison narratives. So I'll begin this uh, part of the talk with this quote from Elaine Scarry, from her essay, The Difficulty of Imagining Other People. And she says, the human capacity to injure other people has always been much greater than its ability to imagine other people. Or perhaps we should say the human capacity to injure other people is very great, precisely because our capacity to imagine other people is very small. I use this quotation from Elaine Scarry's powerful essay on the limits of human empathy and the seemingly limitless capacity for human cruelty as a starting point to this discussion of prison narratives as it focuses our attention on how suffering is expressed in narrative. And it requires us to think about how we read narratives of suffering. How can we, as privileged readers, bear witness to the traumatic experiences endured by political prisoners in a meaningful way, in a way that goes beyond merely making sympathetic noises uh, in the face of another's suffering? How can we, as readers located in the West, read and engage with narratives of violence, torture, imprisonment, and suffering particularly when these narratives depict experiences in cultural uh, and national locations with which the West has a compromised and often vexed relationship. Beginning with Marina Nemat's Prisoner of Tehran, 2007 saw the proliferation of diasporic Iranian women's prison narratives written in English. Other prison narratives published in 2007 include Camellia and Tehobi Fard's Camellia, Save Yourself by Telling the Truth, and the collection We Live to Tell, political prison memoirs of Iranian women. These were followed by Zahra Qahramani's My Life as a Traitor, Hale Esvalyori's My Prison, My Home, One Woman's Story of Captivity in Iran, Roxana Sabedi's Between Two Worlds, My Life in Captivity in Iran, and most recently, Shahla Talibi's Ghosts of Revolution, Rekindled Memories of Imprisonment in Iran. Diasporic Iranian prison narratives are part of a wave of testimonial literatures that foreground suffering mobilizing what Gillian Whitlock has called a rights discourse that impels the reader to take up a compassionate stance. The emotive power of humanitarian narratives is particularly significant for generating ethical and moral responses to the suffering body. However, as Joseph Slaughter and Sophia McClellan have cautioned, we live in an era when the language of human rights is everywhere and therefore nowhere because it has become a tool wielded by both the left and the right to serve their own political agendas. Cultural critics, then, need to engage with the question of humanitarianism and human rights while remaining vigilant against the possible emptying out of the meaning and the power of such terms as human rights or social justice. The proliferation of humanitarian narratives through the genre of the diasporic Iranian prison memoir is critical for engendering Western sympathy for the suffering Iranian subject. It's, it is worth examining which narratives have a wider reach? Why do some stories engender more sympathy than others? Um, one answer, I think, could be that readers respond to what is familiar to them. So Julie Rack has made this argument uh, about the appeal of genre. There's a, a, a familiarity and a comfort in repetition. So I suggest that some of the more popular prison narratives deploy recognizable narrative codes and genres that appeal to a wider audience, such as, for example, the captivity narrative or the romance novel. 
North America is where the captivity genre originated, and it can be traced back to early modern Western, uh, to an early modern Western literary tradition that reflects Western anxieties about colonial uh, exploration and explo exploitation. Captivity narratives usually involve a physical, usually sexualized threat uh, of the male native other to the vulnerable American or British uh, female body. This popular genre with roots in uh, 17th century New World <coughs> contact narratives experienced a resurge in popularity with Betty Mahmoudi's Not Without My Daughter, published in 1987, as both Farzana Miloni and Gillian Whitlock have observed. The popularity of prison, uh, prison memoirs, such as Neymat's Prisoner of Tehran, Qahramani's My Life as a Traitor, and to a lesser extent, Entekhabi Fard's Camellia, can be in part attributed to the fact that they fulfill North American readers' expectations of what constitutes a female captivity narrative. In the tradition of the captivity genre, their stories are both racialized and eroticized. And I want to just make clear that I'm not taking issue with the truth of these authors' accounts of their brutalizing experiences in prison. Rather, I am trying to uh, point out that the recognizable genre of the, ca of the captivity narrative invokes a familiar threat, the vulnerability of young women in the face of powerful dominating men, often in a racialized context. Working within the generic tradition of colonial stories of captivity, Neymat's Prisoner of Tehran sets up a dichotomy between Neymat's own more civilized Christianity and the barbaric, in this case, Muslim worldview of her captors. Thus, the fictional tropes of the captivity narrative, which has Christian inflections, are familiar to Western readership and risk confirming, rather than contesting, generalized images of a threatening uh, Iran. In her memoir, Neymat details the conditions of her arrest and imprisonment at age 16 in Iran's notorious Evin prison. Neymat is tortured and sentenced to death, but is dramatically rescued moments before her ex uh, execution by her interrogator, who forces her to marry him. It's a sensational story in which her interrogator slash husband um, is soon murdered by his own colleagues uh, in Evin. But thanks to the help of her in-laws, Neymat is released and eventually escapes to Canada settling and raising a family in Aurora, Ontario, which is a suburb of Toronto, Canada, where I live. In My Life as a Traitor, Zahra Qahramani, ar arrested at age 20 and held in Evin for participating in student protests, foregrounds her mother's Zoroastrian faith and positions herself as an exotic and pre-Islamic Persian princess. Camelia Intikhabi Fard is Muslim but takes pains early in the book to situate herself within a secular and westernized family. Thus, Neymat, Qahramani, and Entekhabi Fard write about Iran from minority positions. They foreground their minority religious status uh, and their secular, secular westernized position. All three emphasize their Persianness as opposed to the Muslimness reviled in the West. Neymat, Qahramani's, and Entekhabi Fard's narratives are also highly eroticized, following the trop tropic conventions of both the captivity genre and the Harlequin romance, which hinge on the anxieties that emerge in response to the sexual threat posed by the figure of an often swarthy man. All three texts work within a framework of heterosexualized power relations between the male captor and the female captive. The figure of the brutish lover won over by a diminutive, meek, young woman, conventional and popular romance, is a feature shared in both Camellia and Prisoner of Tehran, although Enta Khabifar presents herself in a more active role as her interrogator's seducer, while Neymat remains an unwilling and passive victim. What I'm suggesting is that this, the familiarity of the romance captivity narrative is what may account um, for, its wide, uh, for, for its wide appeal to Western readership. Indeed, Neymat has become a minor celebrity in Canada. It also accounts for the angry rejection of this narrative by some former Iranian political prisoners, many of whom now live in Canada or Europe. Although I have pointed to the recognizable fictional tropes within which Neymat, Entekhabi Fards, and Qahramani's texts operate, my in intention, believe it or not, is not to dismiss their accounts of torture, imprisonment, and suffering. Rather, I'm interested in how certain life stories are told through the mobilization of recognizable generic conventions and the effects of the circulation of these texts. All three prison narratives compel a humanitarian response from the reader as witness. These narratives engender some kind of feeling in the reader that can be a socially and politically transformative response to another's traumatic experience. 
However, while this engendered compassion may have transformative political or personal potential for the Western and Iranian reader of the prison memoir, we need also to bear in mind Lauren Berlant's claim that, and these are her words, compassion is a term denoting privilege. The sufferer is over there. The gap that opens up between the object of compassion and the compassionate subject is where expressions of humanitarianism are articulated, underscoring how feelings of compassion and humanitarianism are inextricably bound up with complex relations of power. The humanitarian response then actually demands less from us. We can express feelings of sorrow or pity regarding an isolated case without turning a self-reflexive critical eye towards the larger social and political system which creates inequalities and hierarchies, a system in which we may ourselves be complicit. Shahla Talibi's Ghosts of Revolution, published in 2011, is a pre prison memoir that operates in a different register than any of the ones previously discussed. Unlike the prison memoirs considered um, earlier, Talibi offers a historical contextualization of Iranian society and politics that does not lend itself to hastily drawn uh, conclusions about the country as a unilaterally brutal place. Rather than working within the limits of the genres of the captivity narrative or of the romance novel, Ghost of Revolution can be described in terms of what John Beverly has termed the testimonio, which translates as testimony, the act of bearing witness to injustice. Talibi writes in graceful prose, intertwining her memories of suffering and torture in prison with those of her fellow inmates and of their collective efforts to keep themselves intact under the dehumanizing effects of torture. Talibi's memoir, an emotionally, emotionally challenging read, is a story of defiance against oppression and a binding love between those who have suffered the unimaginable torments of political prisons. This is a powerful text that bears witness to the traumatic effects of torture and imprisonment in Iran and to, horror, and to the horror of the mass executions of 1988, during which thousands of political prisoners, including her own husband, were summarily killed and thrown into unmarked graves. Now a faculty member in the Department of Religious Studies at Arizona State University, Talibi's memoir engages with questions of torture and suffering through a deeply personal and complex theoretical lens. Indeed, Talibi's narrative works in deliberate and thoughtful ways as a challenge to Elaine Scarry's formulation of torture as language destroying. Her memoir is a poignant and deeply moving testimonial to both the cruelties and the generosities of human relationships. In response to the attempted destruction of her voice, Talibi offers a moving account of her experience in prison and as a victim of torture. Describing her reaction to the fate of some of her former cellmates who shortly after their release succumbed to the traumatic memories of torture and imprisonment by committing suicide or descending into madness, um, Talibi writes, oh, and I, f I forgot to show you these covers from, I'll just go, Camellia and, uh, and the other text I discussed. discussed. <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, a quote from uh, Talib. I realized that I was not writing or dreaming about my experience, or more accurately, did not know what I was dreaming about, nor was I aware if I was even dreaming at all. It was a state of despair, a space of silence and lost voice. I was no longer even singing to myself as I used to. Horrified by this realization, I reluctantly began to write and my writings were saturated with the ghosts of the dead and the spirits of the mad. Putting pen to paper, she expresses her voice and shares her memories alongside descriptions of her friends and cellmates, articulating a vision of humanity that conceives of human relationships as interdependent, stressing her belief that the well-being of oneself is necessarily dependent upon the well-being of others. Every chapter in Ghosts of Revolution incorporates stories of other people, whose lives became inextricably intertwined with Talibi's own in prison, and whose sufferings impressed themselves upon her memory. With sensitivity and empathy, Talibi traces and narrates the trajectory of each individual's life. In extreme cases, as in the, ir in the irrevocably damaged young Roya, who has removed herself cognitively and emotionally from her immediate surroundings, Talibi and her fellow prisoners hypothesize about her life before prison. Speculating about her middle-class background, Talibi fleshes out Roya's pre-prison life, 
thus offering her in the fullness of generosity and even without her awareness, memories of happiness, love and security, a time before prison and before torture. Throughout her memoir, Talibi offers moving descriptions of her inmates, even humanizing a particularly despised recanter, Fozi, um, by contextualizing her story through a sympathetic um, framework. Um, that, that, uh, by, uh, by uh, contextualizing her story through the sympathetic framework, uh, she challenges Scary's claim um, w that I mentioned earlier um, when Sc Scary said, our capacity to imagine other people is very small. Talibi intertwines these descriptions of others' lives into, uh, with memories of her own past, of her family, and of her husband, who was executed in 1988. In Ghosts of Revolution, Talibi puts forward a vision of the individual as always already contingent on another. In an example, uh, Talibi relates the story of Sudi and Behruz, who were subjected to torture in the same chamber. <clears throat> as related by Sudi, even in the extremities of pain, Behruz was full of love and empathy for her suffering and gave her the tools with which to survive, even as he knew his own death under torture was inevitable. Thus, Talibi's memoir as testimonial makes claims on the reader to respond to narratives of suffering in ethically and politically responsible ways. But it also places stress on the modern conception of the individual as self-contained and autonomous. What her memoir draws our attention to is our collective responsibility to be empathetic, to care for others, and to bear witness to suffering. As Talibi relates her visceral account of pain and torture, she writes also of resilience and of the possibility of retaining one's humanity, one's ability to feel empathy, even in the most brutal of conditions. Ghosts of Revolution is about the resilience of ordinary people in dehumanizing and degrading conditions. It is also, uncomfortably, the story of the evils committed by ordinary people in ordinary circumstances such as her recounting of her memories of the torture and suffering inflicted on the village dog by a group of boys when she was a child, or of the pleasure with which her teachers inflicted corporeal punishment on nonconformist students. <coughs> Talibi interweaves her memories of the torture to which she and others were subjected to in prison with her childhood memories of the physical and emotional suffering inflicted by other children on their peers. A particularly disturbing episode for her family involved a group of young men who tormented and terrorized her good-natured but slow-witted cousin, Youssef, by tossing him into a fast-moving river in the full knowledge that he did not know how to swim. Gulping the water, frozen and paralyzed, he stared at death spreading over him. His last look at the world he knew till then was at the devilish expressions in his friend's eyes and their grinning faces enjoying themselves at his expense. This time of eternity for Youssef was also the moment of exceeding pleasure for his co-workers, an instant during which Youssef crossed the line to the world of the absolute other. Drawing comparisons between this instance of group violence and the mass prison killings in 1988, she writes, the way that everyone seemed to have played a part in drawing Youssef to his final destination reminds me of the massacre of political prisoners in the summer of 1988. The prison officials pursued a policy of having everyone's hands in the system covered with prisoners' blood. It was to keep everyone silent about the massacre, for if they spoke, the secret of their own role in the crime would be revealed. Talibi's memoir thus extends a significant challenge to readers. It requires us to self-reflect in ways that can be deeply uncomfortable, asking us to imagine not only the suffering of others when they are at a safe remove, but also to reflect on the disturbing affinities between the cruelties to which human beings subject each, other, <clears throat> subject, subject each other in their quotidian lives, with the torture and betrayal of friends and cellmates in the heightened, harrowing context such as prison. Talebi's memoir then compels us to contemplate and acknowledge in profoundly unsettling ways the limits of our own humanity. Thinking about memoir as a genre that generates feelings of empathy for the suffering of another and as a mode of expression that humanizes another affords us an understanding of the prison memoir, memoir both as a testimonial that bears witness against injustice and as a humanitarian narrative that demands of us to rethink our conceptions of ourselves as self-contained individuals. The prison memoir places stress on our ability to feel empathy and challenges us to articulate an uncompromising commitment 
to an ideal of human rights that is inclusive of all. I'd like to end now by circling back to where I began, to a consideration of how diasporic life narratives place memory and testimony at the heart of their stories. As readers, we're placed in the role of witness to narratives of historical injustices and atrocities. By opening ourselves up to these often traumatic stories, we allow ourselves to be touched by the experiences of others. Once we are touched by their narratives, we can no longer look away or unlearn what we have come to know. The potential of this moment offers, I believe, a glimmer of hope. How do these stories impress themselves upon us, and what do they demand of us as readers? What will we choose to do with the stories that we read? Thank you.